You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Addressing Gettysburg. My name is Cody Aish. I am here once again to talk a bit about an aspect of Gettysburg memory. Uh, thank you again to Matt and Eric for the opportunity to be back on the podcast. Matt had invited me a couple of weeks ago to uh, do a an interview with him that we'll be doing here in the next couple of days pertaining to uh, a famous figure of the battle, Brigadier General John Buford, and a bit about his legacy at Gettysburg and really just kind of in Civil War memory in general. But, uh, but today we're going to talk a bit about a figure who I have talked about in the past here on the podcast, and that is Frederick Douglass. Now, if you listened last year, 2020, when I did an episode on Douglas and kind of some of the things that he said about Robert E. Lee after Lee died in October of 1870, you'll be familiar kind of with the character of Frederick Douglass as pertains to his views on the Civil War's legacy, particularly with regard to, in that case, Robert E. Lee, a most famous figure probably of the Confederacy. But Today we're going to focus a bit more in depth on Douglas and Gettysburg itself. He came to the town in January 1869. On the day that I'm recording this, it's January 25th, and this is the 152nd anniversary of when Douglas came to Gettysburg and spoke. And we'll talk a lot about what he said, where he said it, what he did while he was in Gettysburg, but also kind of looming in the backdrop of this entire subject is the overarching theme of Civil War memory, especially that early memory at the time of Reconstruction in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War itself. And that does play quite a large role in what Douglas says at Gettysburg, but I would say even more significantly for the sake of understanding Gettysburg's place in the post-Civil War years, looking at how the townspeople reacted to his presence in Gettysburg. And the way that we'll do that is by looking at how the local press reacted, uh, how they editorialized from both the Democratic point of view and the Republican point of view whether Douglas gave a good speech, whether it was a good idea that he was in Gettysburg at all. And what this really all ties back to is the complexity that the Civil War left behind. We so often think about 1865 being the end of the war and both sides get up and, as the saying goes, shake hands across the bloody chasm. But for millions of Americans, uh, especially African Americans like Frederick Douglass, who himself was, of course, formerly enslaved, The Civil War takes on a whole new meaning in its aftermath, uh, securing the fruits of victory, making sure that everything that was gained by the United States triumph in the Civil War over the Confederacy, that it was followed through, uh, that there would be equal rights granted to African Americans and, you know, to even larger groups of people as time wore on to ensure that Southern states had, uh, had in essence, learned a lesson from attempting to secede from the Union uh, to try people, as, as many saw fit, for treason, for being traitors to the American Republic. That was the sort of uh, idea that was, that was taking shape at this point in time in the 5, 10, upward of 15 years after the Civil War until the nation kind of settles into that what we like to call reconciliation period when those more complex matters of politics and morality sort of fizzle away and build the base of that idea that we have today that uh, that white veterans on both sides shook hands and really kind of reflected more upon the noble effort of having been in battle against one another and ultimately having the ability to reconcile in the aftermath of the conflict. But that was a long process and stories like the one that we're focusing on today with regard to Frederick Douglass being at Gettysburg, um, they, they play you know quite a role in our understanding of, of how those things take place. And this also, you know, speaking of place, uh, does tell us a lot about Gettysburg. I've been on a few times now, and more so than talking about the Battle of Gettysburg, listeners will have realized that uh, I really like to look at Gettysburg as, as the place of Civil War memory. If Americans today go visit any Civil War battlefield, typically it is Gettysburg. Gettysburg is the only major battle of the Civil War that has inspired 
quite the number of monuments that are there, the number of museums that are in the town, the number of, uh, of art pieces in, in the form of paint, uh, in the form of poetry. I, even today, we can extend this to you know, how many battles in American history inspire their own podcasts or, or group of podcasts, uh, such as this one is here at Addressing Gettysburg. And Frederick Douglass recognized that, hence one of the reasons why he visited town in 1869. So what we're going to do essentially is look at just a brief biographical background of Douglas. I won't go too into depth, but just so we're all generally on the same page about who he was and where he was at this point in his life and his career. And we're going to talk a bit about the wartime experience of Douglas, particularly regarding his relationship with President Abraham Lincoln. He had quite an evolving opinion of Lincoln. And this Civil War era relationship that he has with the president, where they meet on a couple of occasions, uh, does certainly influence what Douglas said at Gettysburg in 1869. Uh, not to mention that you know any speech given at Gettysburg since November 1863 is bound to be compared with the Gettysburg Address, with Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and, and Douglas, to a degree, is no exception to that. We're going to have to go a bit further back in history as well for a brief period. I'll, I'll explain here in a bit. The subject that Douglas spoke about at Gettysburg um, is, is situated not just in American history and understanding the Civil War, but also in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, when Douglas looks back at the 80 years war, and this would be the founding of the Dutch Republic when the Netherlands is breaking away from Spain. And... Douglas kind of compares that story of the Dutch seeking religious liberty with the United States through the American Revolution seeking, you know, initially uh, religious liberty, but eventually political liberty from the crown, from Great Britain. And Douglas sees that that is further extended to what many people have called the second founding of the United States through the Civil War. So he does take us on quite a bit of a history lesson through the, the words that he spoke at Gettysburg. And then, of course, the other facet of this we'll talk about is Douglas's time in Gettysburg. Um, it's it's a pretty brief, rather quiet time compared to when Lincoln came in November 1863, when Major General Oliver Howard uh, commanded the 11th Corps during the battle, commands uh, eventually an army under William Sherman in the Western Theater of the war. And in the aftermath of the war, Howard becomes the chairman of the of the Freedmen's Bureau, playing a key role in um, in preserving the equality that had been established by the Civil War. But Howard returns to Gettysburg in 1865 to dedicate the base of the Soldiers National Monument at the center of, of Soldiers National Cemetery. Ulysses Grant had been to Gettysburg uh, in 1867, June of that year, about a year and a half before he was elected to the presidency. Uh, Grant's first vice president, Schuller Colfax, who was the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States during the Civil War. He visited Gettysburg, and so did Winfield Scott Hancock, commander of the Second Corps during the battle. And all of these visits by these VIPs of both a military and a civilian sort, all of them have this great fanfare, uh, quite a bit of press coverage, uh, quite a bit of folks following them around as they tour the battlefield, and we can trace many of their steps. For Douglas, this doesn't seem to be quite the same experience, and we'll talk a bit about some of the reasons why that might have been. And I'll mostly let Douglas speak for himself when we get to the speech itself. Uh, the text that he used is much longer than I have time for. It was uh, about a two, two and a half hour speech, depending on uh, whose account you read as far as folks who listen to him speak. And there are several versions of the text as well. We're not exactly sure which one he used at Gettysburg, but the copy of the speech that uh, or the, the title of the speech that he gave was called William the Silent, which is a figure who we'll talk about who he compared quite a bit with Abraham Lincoln, uh, who would have lived at the time of the 80 Years War in which it was a prominent Dutch leader. He he gave several versions of this speech spanning from the late 1860s to the early 1870s, and unfortunately, none of them are labeled as specifically the uh, uh, the the monograph uh, that he would have used at uh, at Gettysburg. And so, I'm gonna you know quote from a, uh, excerpts from a few iterations of this speech, and we'll talk more about uh, 
about that here in a little while. And then lastly, we're going to analyze kind of this personal and press reactions to Douglas's address and his presence in Gettysburg. As we will see, a forewarning, it was highly partisan. It was incredibly racial and in some instance racist feedback that that he received. And in, and in a few incidents, as a fair warning, um, I won't directly quote, but uh, but there's an insinuation that uh, some pretty harsh racial language was used, terms that uh, certainly today and even to a degree in 18. 69 would have uh, would have been deemed offensive. Now, where I want to begin with the story here is that in 1879, so a decade after Douglas was in Gettysburg, a Boston portrait painter and a landscape artist whose name was Albion Harris Bicknell, he created a piece called Lincoln at Gettysburg, November 19th, 1863. It was first made into a colored painting And then it later sold in a serial fashion um, as a 24 by 39 and a half inch steel engraving. And it ranged from $10 for a simple print, equivalent to about $270 today, uh, all the way to $30 for the artist proof, which is about $801, $802 today. And the image was described at its time as according to a pamphlet that accompanied it, quote, the leading American engraving of an American subject by an American author, or I'm sorry, by an American painter. And this corresponding pamphlet was uh, was published by a Boston art gallery called Dahl and Richards, and it provided this further explanation of the piece, its figures, and its meaning. And basically, of course, we're here in an audio format. I can't show you the, the painting, but if you look it up, uh, Albie and Harris Bicknell, Lincoln at Gettysburg, you can find some rather low-resolution copies of this online. People sell... Uh, sell some on eBay. You can you can look at those images, but it's Lincoln on the rostrum room at Gettysburg. It doesn't really look like the National Cemetery. There are some artistic liberties taken here, but on the stage he's surrounded by a host of individuals who are not actually at the dedication of Soldiers National Cemetery in 1863, but rather it's a group of of people uh, who the artist believed influenced the words of the Gettysburg Address. And so uh, Bicknell, the, the artist, he described this uh, this contingent of people as one of the most notable gatherings ever assembled in the United States. And this fictional rendering, according to the pamphlet, says that the artist has availed himself of the opportunity presented by the occasion to group around the grand central figure of Abraham Lincoln, some of the most prominent of the statesmen and soldiers of the war period. And so what you have are 21 individuals. This in- includes, among others, both of Lincoln's vice presidents, Hannibal Hamlin and Andrew Johnson, four of Lincoln's cabinet members, four wartime governors, five United States congressmen, and five United States generals. And the pamphlet describes the categories of those included as cabinet ministers, war governors, statesmen, generals, and in the case of one lone figure in the painting, quote unquote, the race made free in the struggle. And so Bicknell observed that it would be difficult to select 21 men more representative of the elements, both military and civil, in defense of the Union. And when we look at this selection of people that he chose, you can see that all of them are men, quite notable. All but one of them held political office and or served in the military by the close of the war, and all but one of these were white. And the sole exception to both of those, the only man who did not hold political office during the war and did not serve in the military before the end of the war was Frederick Douglass. So Douglass is this kind of unique, looming figure who is unlike anybody else in the course of of this painting of Lincoln speaking at Gettysburg in 1863. And I would say that generally speaking, Douglas's inclusion in this print, it kind of represented a rare public acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement of his personal impact on Lincoln's ideology, the ideology of Lincoln's administration, and really the whole Northern War effort during the Civil War. Douglas was often described as this kind of unofficial central figurehead of the wartime and post-war African-American movement for civic inclusion across the nation, for racial equality. And despite Douglas's absence at the actual dedication of Soldiers National Cemetery 
I think we could say that the spirit of his life's work was present in a really symbolic sense on that occasion. And so it's, it is rightful that uh, Bicknell chose him uh, as, a, as a figure to be presented in this painting. David Blight, who has written uh, a major biography of, of Frederick Douglass, published in 2018, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, he wrote this in an earlier essay. Dr. Blight said that, quote, Lincoln's performance reflected a shared vision of the meaning of the war. And he's talking about uh, his performance at Gettysburg in 1863. And Blight says that ideologically, Douglas had become Lincoln's alter ego, his stalking horse and minister of propaganda, the intellectual godfather of the Gettysburg Address. The rhetoric of 1863, says Blight, fashioned by Douglas, Lincoln, and others, underscored the importance of the Civil War as a transformation in history freedom and as an American second founding. Notwithstanding the contemporary inclusion and adulation, in many social and political circles, Douglas went unacknowledged and unpaid, according to Blight. And so that's an interesting starting place, I think, in terms of how people considered Douglas at Gettysburg uh, in this fictionalized aspect in 1879, this painting of Lincoln and all the people who might have, uh, have inspired the words of the Gettysburg Address. Now, who was Frederick Douglass by the time he comes to Gettysburg in 1869. Douglass is born into slavery, we believe, in February 1818. He always thought that he was actually a year older than what he truly was. He thought he was born in 1817. He didn't know his exact birth date. He remembered as a as a child, one of his rare memories of his mother was, uh, was her calling him my little Valentine. And so Douglass... Uh, accepts that February 14th would be a, a suitable uh, birthday, and that's how he would celebrate it each year. He escapes from slavery at age 20, at that point enslaved in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. He escapes on September 3rd, 1838. He first moves to New York City. He marries Anna Murray, who is a free black woman from Baltimore, who would be his wife until her death 44 years later. Uh, he'll seek shelter with the Ruggles, and the Johnson families. And at various times, he adempts these temporary surnames of uh, Stanley and Johnson. He eventually, from the poem Lady of the Lake by Sir Walter Scott, he learns of the name Douglas and spells it with two S's and accepts that as, uh, as his surname for the remainder of his life. And of course, how he's most famous. He was born as Frederick Bailey. He went up fleeing to Massachusetts in the New Bedford, kind of outskirts of Boston. He joins William Lloyd Garrison's wing of abolitionism. Douglas, in 1845, will publish the first of his three autobiographies called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. A decade later, he published the second larger volume of his, uh, of his memoirs called My Bondage and My Freedom. And then much later, three decades later, in 1881, he published The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass. He also wrote a, uh, a short uh, essay, a short story called The Heroic Slave, and that was featured in a book called Autographs for Freedom, and that was published in 1853. And Douglass will kind of self-exile after his first autobiography. He goes to Europe. He will tour uh, England, Ireland, other countries, becomes kind of a international celebrity, preaching and speaking against American slavery, and ultimately his uh, his manumission papers are going to be signed and, and purchased, his his legal freedom, by a group of abolitionists in England. And so he's able to return to the United States not long after that. And Douglas is going to, of course, famously, I would, I would say, uh, launch one of the more known newspapers of the antebellum era, and that is the North Star. When Douglas comes back to the United States, it's in 1847 that in Rochester, New York, He'll kind of adopt that as his home city, and he'll start the North Star. He merges it with another abolitionist, uh, Garrett Smith's paper called the Liberty Party Paper, and this forms Frederick Douglass's paper, which is published in Rochester from 1851 to 1858. He transfers then to Douglass's Monthly, which is published in Rochester from 1858 until the first couple of years of the Civil War. It ceases publication in 1863. And then you know, seven years later, uh, in Washington, D.C., he starts the New National Era, which had absorbed 
a previous paper called The New Citizen. And his title, New National Era, was an ode to uh, a former abolitionist paper just called The National Era, which had ceased publication after 13 years in 1860. And Douglas would edit, own and edit the New National Era from 1870 to 74. And he uses the pages of these papers to kind of agitate the status quo in favor of subjects like emancipation, civil rights, equal protection under the law. In uh, Douglas's Monthly, at the start of the Civil War, Douglas repeatedly commented on the war effort, political leadership, and military officers. And I would say that most noteworthy was his commentary on Lincoln from 1858 to 63, before and during the early years of the war. And he's very frustrated with Lincoln along the way for not pursuing a more aggressive means of emancipation or abolition. And what really kind of infuriated him more than any other time was August 22nd, 1862, part of what I like to call the summer of the 22nds. This is a summer that July 22nd is when Lincoln first announces to his cabinet that he's thinking about issuing a preliminary emancipation proclamation. Exactly one month later, on August 22nd, Lincoln will will meet with this black delegation to discuss the subject of colonization. It's really kind of a low moment in terms of uh, of. Lincoln's racial efforts, and Douglas and others are rightfully very critical of the president for that. And then one month later, he'll totally reverse course on September 22nd and issue that preliminary Emancipation Proclamation in the aftermath of of the United States victory at the Battle of Antietam, where the Army of the Potomac drove Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army in Northern Virginia out of Maryland. And you know, this timeline really kind of sets up the, the year of Jubilee, as it's oftentimes called, of 1863, of course, which begins on New Year's Day with the issuance of the formal Emancipation Proclamation. And through the course of 1863, and even a few months before and a few months after, from, I guess you could say, 1862 to 64, Douglas and Lincoln are now sort of starting to read from the same script. And if we look at Lincoln's Gettysburg Address of November 19th, 1863, and look at some other speeches that Douglas is giving around this time, speeches like the Slaveholders' Rebellion, as one was called, or Our Work Is Not Yet Done, um, other speeches along these lines, The Mission of the War is another great example of this. Lincoln and Douglas are coming to the same point, although they have gotten there from very different original starting points. As a, a few examples here, we have Douglas delivering a speech in which he said, 86 years ago, the 4th of July was consecrated and distinguished among all the days of the year as the birthday of American liberty and independence. And this has a striking similarity to Lincoln's four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Douglas, in another address, says that probably not one of those fathers of the Republic ever dreamed to witness the strains and portentous events now transpiring before our eyes, and which even now cast a cloud of more than midnight blackness over the face of the country. It's more wordy than Lincoln's more straightforward speaking style, but the theme of that uh, excerpt, very similar to Lincoln, saying at Gettysburg, now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And there are quite a few examples along these lines. I think another really prime example, which matches up extremely well, almost word for for word in, in terms of its feel, is that Douglas said, our work is not done. Protest, affirm, hope, glorify. We have work to do, friends and fellow citizens. Our work will not be done until the colored man is admitted a full member in good and regular standing in the American body politic. This unfinished work, as he said, very similar to exactly what Lincoln said at Gettysburg. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. And so on and so forth. Many of of these examples, you can go line for line through the Gettysburg Address and... uh, and you'll find some Douglas speech because in part he spoke so much that uh, that matches it in theme, in feel, even sometimes in exact words. Douglas and Lincoln will meet, and this kind of really sets the stage for 
what Douglas says at Gettysburg in 1869, they'll meet three times through the course of the Civil War. The first time is August 1st, 1863, when Douglas will approach Lincoln. He literally just comes to the White House and he will have um, have a meeting with Lincoln regarding equal pay for black United States soldiers as well as retribution for murdered African-American prisoners of war. And Douglas is very laudatory of Lincoln. Uh, he says just a few months after having met him that he received me just as, we, as you have seen one gentleman receive another with a hand and a voice well balanced between a kind cordiality and a respectful reserve. I tell you, I felt big there. While Abraham Lincoln will not go down to posterity, as Abraham the Great, or Abraham the Wise, or Abraham the Eloquent, although he is all three, wise, great, and eloquent, he will go down to posterity if the country is saved as honest Abraham. And going down thus, his name may be written anywhere in this wide world of ours, side by side with that of Washington. Their second meeting will take place about a year later, August 25th, 1864. And on this occasion, Lincoln is going to suggest to Douglas that uh, with it being uncertain whether Lincoln would be elected to a second term as president come November, he wanted Douglas to ensure that the fruits of the Emancipation Proclamation could be fully used. And he suggests to Douglas that he go to the South and smuggle enslaved persons to freedom. And Douglas would later write that this was, in his mind, kind of a less violent version of what John Brown had hoped to do at Harper's Ferry in 1859. And uh, Douglas said in his final memoir, speaking of this second meeting with Lincoln, that, quote, he spoke with great earnestness and much solicitude. What he said on this day showed a deeper moral conviction against slavery than I had seen before in anything spo spoken or written by him. And the third and final meeting will take place March 4th, 1865, at Lincoln's second inauguration. Douglas would reflect that Lincoln's inaugural address, most famous for its last couple of paragraphs, the mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. Lincoln's calls to bind up the nation's wounds to achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace. That speech, of course, very famous today, but celebrated in that moment as well. And Douglas would reflect that the address sounded more like a sermon than a state paper. And Douglas wrote that these solemn words struck me at the time. I clapped my hands in gladness and thanksgiving at their utterance. And when he meets Lincoln at the inaugural ball, after that speech has been delivered, he is initially accosted by a couple of policemen who won't let him in for being black into the president's inaugural ball. And Lincoln reportedly says, here comes my friend Douglas. And Douglas says that taking me by the hand, Lincoln said, I am glad to see you. I saw you in the crowd today li listening to my inaugural dress. How did you like it? And he said, uh, Douglas says that uh, he told Lincoln, I must not detain you with my poor opinion when there are thousands waiting to shake hands with you. No, no, said Lincoln. You must stop a little, Douglas. There is no man in this country whose opinion I value more than yours. I want to know what you think of it. And I replied, said Douglas, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. And then Douglas will deliver a eulogy of sorts of Lincoln on April 15th, 1865, the day that Lincoln died. He's in Rochester. He's asked to speak kind of impromptu. And on that occasion, Douglas would say in part, there's a deep grief upon this hell black assassination as a new demonstration of the guilt of slavery. Douglas said that he could feel it a severe stab at Republican institutions, a personal as well as national calamity, and a dreadful disaster that has befallen the nation. But there was room for hope, Douglas said, as, quote, the blood of our beloved martyred president will be the salvation of our country. Good man we call him. Good man he was. If an honest man is the noblest work of God, we need have no fear for the soul of Abraham Lincoln. And Douglas would deliver multiple more speeches on the memory of Lincoln, including at Lincoln's tomb, including on the anniversary of emancipation on several occasions, and perhaps most famously in 1876, 
at the dedication of the Freedmen's Memorial near the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. Uh, Thomas Ball's famous, sort of today controversial, uh, monument of a, of a kneeling slave rising under Lincoln's guiding hand who was holding the Emancipation Proclamation in, in the other. Um, the, at that occasion, April 14th, 1876, the 11th anniversary of Lincoln having been assassinated, Douglas delivers a, a keynote speech believed to be one of the best speeches ever delivered about Abraham Lincoln and, and well worth reading if you have not done so. Now, in these early post-war years, David Blight, again, Douglas biographer, he said that uh, Blight says that Douglas had called a quote unquote pledge to never forget the meaning of the Civil War. And that stems from at least five sources, says Blight, in Douglas's thought and experience. The first one was Douglas's insistence that the Civil War had been an ideological conflict with deeply moral consequences. The second source of Douglas's thought and experience is what Blight calls Douglas's refurbished nationalism, highlighted by his sense of nationhood and the secure social identity that he hoped emancipation and equality would one day offer every black person in America. The third theme would be the resurgent racism in the country and the rise of the lost cause mentality. Of course, this ideology that still in many ways persists to this day that the Confederacy fought for largely noble ideals, that it was states' rights, not slavery, that they had seceded for, despite what was said in secession ordinances and other documents in 1860 and 1861. And this racism that is now resurging in the Reconstruction era and the aftermath of the war has quite a substantial role in many of Douglas's uh, feelings and thoughts and, and writings. Fourth says Blight about Douglas in the post-war years, he had a claim that the country had been seduced into national forgetfulness, a peculiar American condition of historical anemia, I'm sorry, uh, amnesia. This is a constant concern for Douglas, that people forgot what the Civil War had gained. And five, the final uh, kind of theme that Blight says that Douglas is focusing on in the aftermath of the war is a tremendous emotional and psychological investment in Douglas's own conception of the legacy of the conflict. And that's what this Gettysburg speech is kind of dripping in, is this uh, this idea of, of memory of the Civil War in general, of emancipation in particular, and how does that fit into the broader scheme of world history, not just American history, but now that the United States is on the world stage as a long-standing republic which had been able to save itself despite a civil war and end what many would consider its gravest national sin, that of chattel slavery. Douglas will write a note on August 24th, 1868 to his friend and fellow abolitionist Garrett Smith saying that, quote, I am this summer endeavoring to make myself a little more familiar with history. My ignorance of the past has long been a trouble to me. And it's at this time that Douglas is going to apparently read a three-volume major history by John Lothrop Motley called The Rise of the Dutch Republic. Now, Motley served as a United States diplomat to Russia before the Civil War. And during the conflict, he assisted in deliberations to kind of avert European intervention on behalf of the Confederacy. So we think of Antietam and the Maryland campaign as a watershed moment where the Confederacy is almost you know, gaining sovereign support as a, as a national entity from, from Great Britain, and that never happens. And John Lothar Motley is in many ways uh, ha has a hand in, uh, in making sure that that, that does not happen. Um, Motley's books are really widely distributed, and he serves as what we would today call a popular historian. So I'll think the likes of David McCullough, Ron Chernow, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, biographers and historians of, of renown who published for massive groups of people whose history books aren't just published by academic presses, whose books are on New York Times bestselling lists, things along those lines. Motley is sort of the 19th century equivalent of that. And in these three volumes, The Rise of the Dutch Republic, John Lothar Motley will tell the story of a 16th century war between the Netherlands and Spain. It's the Eighty Years' War, 
as its name implies, it, it takes place over eight decades, from 1568 to 1648. And this is primarily by pitting the Protestant Dutch against the Catholic Spanish. And the books are decidedly pro-Dutch in tone. They praise the efforts of the Protestant Reformation. Motley saw the Dutch resistance and their ultimate success of achieving religious liberty and nationhood as sort of the precursor to the birth of the American Republic. And Motley ultimately, in the course of these books, advocates in favor of violence to achieve revolutionary results. He says that it is okay to use violence if you're trying to gain something for the betterment of a large group of people who feels that they're being subjected to the rule of others. And reading these three volumes will inspire Douglas to write a lecture, which drew largely upon Motley's research into the Spanish Inquisition, into the Eighty Years' War, into the rise of the Dutch Republic, and Douglas saw a way to compare that to U.S. history. Now, Motley had compared it to the rise of uh, the American Republic through the revolution, Douglas takes it a step further. He feels that he can connect these pieces all the way to the Civil War, and that's what he wants his next speech to be about. He talked about to Garrett Smith, as we said, wanting to focus more on history. Now he's doing exactly that. And so Douglas will propose and kind of begin writing a lecture, which involved these three conflicts based upon the liberation of people. The 80 Years' War of the Netherlands against their violent Spanish oppressors, the Revolutionary War, the War for American Independence, of these fledgling American colonies against the tyrannical British Empire, and the United States Civil War, of this you know, group of, of the federal government, of Unionists, of Northerners, of Abolitionists, of African Americans, against a separatist, white supremacist, slaveholding, Southern Confederacy. Those are the terms that Douglas draws out in terms of how he wants to interpret these three wars. And based on the success of Motley's books, this was a topic that, while it's kind of foreign to us today, in that moment, Douglas could confidently take it on the road to the American public, and it seems like people would generally know what he was talking about. The Dutch Republic and the Eighty Years' War are something that we don't focus almost anything on today. I think even in a world history uh, you know, college course, but at the time, Motley's books were successful enough, and Ameri the American people were, of course, not as separated from the events in terms of time as, as we are today. So it was something with which they were generally familiar. Now, locally in Gettysburg, I have to thank my friend John Rudy. Many of you might know him from the National Park Service, from his work at, at Gettysburg College. But he has uh, he has told me, he looked through the, the Pennsylvania College Literary Society uh, records and Pennsylvania College today, Gettysburg College, apparently in the late 1860s did have a copy of, of Mot John Lothar Motley's books available. So at the very least, the college students in Gettysburg were seemingly familiar with, uh, with it. Uh, Angela G. Ray, who is an historian who has focused on Douglas's work with Motley's books and William the Silent, the speech as a whole, she said this was an era when audiences commonly expected an educational experience. And so Douglas's lecture, quote, created the opportunity for a reflective comparison of the goals and results of war across time. And its title signaled a topic that possessed a degree of cultural familiarity in the wake of Motley's publishing success. And so Douglas wanted to provide what uh, historian Angela Ray called an edifying or educational message. And this could be taken on the road. It could be delivered in front of several diverse audiences. And this uh, served as a performance that, quote, appealed to the white Protestant middling classes that were the Lyceum's most stalwart supporters. And it doubled as this kind of public discourse that promoted racial equality, partly through an interpretation of recent history as compared to the distant past. That is, as well, Ray's uh, own words there describing how she sees Douglas in, in this speech. Now, a brief biographical background on William the Silent, the main figure that Douglas spoke about at Gettysburg through his work in, in the Dutch Republic. Uh, William the Silent was, a, was kind of a nickname. His main, main names uh, were William of Orange, which was a principality in France, 
He was also called William of Nassau, which was the surname of his family dating back to the 11th century. He was born in 1533. He rose to the rank of prince at age 11 in 1544. He started the, the House of Orange Nassau as the name William I. He receives a formal education at the court of Charles V, who was the king of the Spanish Empire. He lived luxuriously at Nassau Place in Brussels, and then he was gifted the position at the head of Netherlands royalty after the death of a former prince who was a cousin, but who was childless, child, childless. And so this is the next of kin, is William of Orange or William of Nassau. And he'll be at the siege of St. Dizier in France uh, during the Italian War. Of, uh, of 1542 to, to 1546. He is in the Spanish hierarchy. So he'll become, you know, he'll eventually side with the Dutch in the 80 Years War, but he is the confidant uh, to King Philip II of Spain after the resignation of Charles V. And uh, he's an empire steward to provinces like Holland and Zealand. And as he rises through the ranks, William will witness practices that are perpetrated by Catholics against Protestants, and this causes him to resent the Spanish Empire. Primarily, what concerns him is the execution and persecution of the Dutch in the Low Countries, what is today the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and this is largely being done to these people by the House of Habsburg, which is a dynasty based in what is today Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And so William is going to join others in becoming the head of a political overthrow of Spanish rule. So he's working from the inside to overthrow the Spanish. This will be in the Netherlands following an invasion of Spanish soldiers into Dutch uh, country, uh, into the Dutch countries. He silently plots rebellion against people he sees as oppressors. And this er uh, earns him a nickname, William the Silent. Douglas would later call this the gift of watchful silence rather than of open speech. And Douglas would add that, quote, William's wonderful reticence and self-control at this crisis of his career won for him the affix of William the Silent, the affix by which he has been handed down in history and by which he will be known while history shall endure. And from 1568 to 16, uh, I'm sorry, 1568 to 1583, after he leads the Dutch through several battles, sieges, naval engagements, as well as some of the peace negotiations, with which fail repeatedly, he signs a declaration of independence, and William is assassinated by an extremist named Balthazar Gerard on July 10th, 1584. He's shot in the chest by two Wheelock pistols. Gerard will assassinate William, and William goes down in history as what appears to be the first head of state ever assassinated by a gunshot wound, ever, in all of human history. Uh, Gerard had been paid by the Spanish king, Philip II, to commit this murder, and thus it was uh, William's former boss who essentially paid him uh, uh, to assassinate William, and this will uh, you know, leave him as kind of a martyr uh, to his people at that point in time. Now, that's, of course, quite a bit of background, maybe more than most people would have uh, wanted, but I just wanted to set the, the stage there. I gave this lecture a couple of years ago in 2018 at the uh, GAR Hall in Gettysburg for historic Gettysburg, Adams County, and uh, was limited to about an hour, so I don't think I went nearly as in-depth as I just did, but uh, figure we're not constrained to, uh, to, to too many time constraints here. So I just wanted to give the full context of the background there. But we are now getting to, to Douglas coming to Gettysburg. So Douglas is going to be invited in, in early 1869. An exact date and by whom he was invited is not entirely clear, unfortunately. Um, but there will be a speech that is scheduled for January 25th, 1869. And this is in the midst of this large Lyceum tour that Douglas is, is doing. And uh, just looking at the month of January, he is, you know, on the road through Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and Delaware. He is performing or speaking on 14 occasions, traveling all throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. And when you look at his, his speaking schedule, it's 
pretty similar to uh, you know looking at a, at a touring musician today. But Douglas goes over the course of 23 days from Williamsport, Pennsylvania, to Milton, Pennsylvania, to Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, to Lock Haven, Pennsylvania, to Salem, New Jersey, to Washington, D.C. for two days, to Brooklyn, New York, to New York City, to Newburgh, New York, to Somerville, New Jersey, back to Washington, D.C., to Wilmington, Delaware, then to Gettysburg, and then three days later, he's back home in, in Rochester. But Douglas, by this point in time, in the aftermath of the Civil War, this is the main thing he's doing. He is using his influence that he has gained from being an abolitionist and a formerly enslaved man to being a United States Army recruiter to being of sorts a, a presidential confidant as we've talked about his relationship with Lincoln and he's using those subjects to now speak as a full-time professional orator and he's mostly talking at this point on the history and memory of what he called the abolition war. The Civil War to him was was the abolition war. Sometimes he would call it the Emancipation War or the Slaveholders Rebellion. And that's the main subject he's talking about is where does the Civil War now fit in American history and memory and the ongoing reconstruction and the political and social issues of the day, including black citizenship and voting rights. When he's invited to Gettysburg, this is a site that not only would Douglas and just about every other American have been interested in and familiar with based on it being the site of the battle and of Lincoln's address. But Douglas had a few previous personal connections to the area. One was through James W.C. Pennington. And he was a formerly enslaved order, minister, and writer who had escaped from slavery in Maryland in 1827. And he eventually serves as the officiant for Douglas's first wedding. We mentioned Anna Murray a while ago in New York City. And Douglas mentions and directly quotes the marriage license in his autobiographies. The other personal connection that Douglas had to South Central Pennsylvania and Adams County and, and Gettysburg is through Daniel Alexander Payne, who was also a minister. He was a bishop and a writer. He plays an inter uh, instrumental role in founding the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. He's the first African-American student at the Gettysburg Lutheran Seminary. He's accepted there in 18. 35, just three years after it moved to its location on the western side of town in the famous seminary building topped by the cupola today. And Payne and Douglas knew one another from being sometimes an associate, uh, sometimes kind of an acquaintance, friendship. They had met in 1839. And Douglas, fast forwarding a few decades in 1893, spoke at the funeral of Payne, uh, reflecting on him as a good man and a great man who has left behind a life that will influence the conduct of men for generations to come. That's in part what he said. So clearly holding in high regard this uh, you know, former son of, of Adams County in the form of Daniel Payne. And Douglas had also passed through Gettysburg in 1830, uh, 1843. Excuse me. Uh, this was five years after he escaped from slavery in 1838. And in 1863, while speaking to an audience in Philadelphia, Douglas said that 20 years ago, I came along the vales and hills of Gettysburg, and my friends, the anti-slavery people there, warned me to remain in the house during the daytime and travel in the night, lest I should be captured and carried over into Maryland. So in the era of, you know, approaching the the uh, the, the federal slave codes and, and slave catching laws, the Fugitive Slave Act would be coming not long after Gettysburg being so close to that line between slavery and freedom, the Mason-Dixon line. Um, this is a uh, you know this is a, a tricky situation for a black man who had fled slavery uh, to come through, as he says, the vales and hills of Gettysburg. But uh, but he was very celebratory by 1863 when he's speaking in Philadelphia that he could go through Gettysburg now. And now 1869 he is slated to return. Gettysburg has you know, of course, endured the, the battle. It has endured what the Adam Sentinel, one of the local papers called the desolation, the slaughter and the mangling, terrible and yet uh, and yet glorious, uh, terrible in the din, the dread, the dire destruction of war, glorious in the fruits gathered. Gettysburg is a place that is already becoming the center of Civil War memory. In 1865, dedication of Soldiers National Monument. In 1869, after Douglas would be there, the monument would be completed. 
and entirely um, entirely dedicated. But there's also this kind of racial matter happening in Gettysburg, and Douglas arrives right in the middle of it. Take, for instance, on January 15th, 1869, the Gettysburg Compiler, the town's local Democratic paper, the conservative paper of its era, referred to Republicans as quote-unquote insidious Negroites, and it labeled the Republican Party as the Negro Equality Party. They encouraged their readers to counter the Republican Party, quote, squarely and boldly to be on the alert and to break its force. And then the compiler urged, quote, all conservative men to see to it that Republicans' plans would be foiled as they seek to educate the masses to accept political and social equality with the Negro. And it's notable that that's just 10 days before Douglas's arrival, but there's no mention of it at all. They would also say in that same issue, again, just days before Douglas would arrive in Gettysburg, the compiler says, quote, it is time to put an end to this Negro farce. The Negro is not the white man's equal and no attempt to force him upon the white man, either at the ballot box or in the jury box or in the halls of legislation or in camp with barracks can ever be successful. Bad feeling and bloodshed will follow all such attempts. Later that same year, the compiler questioned whether there was ever a dirtier move by any political party than the effort to place the Negro upon equality with the white man. No decent white man ought to have any difficulty in answering the question himself of whether this would be acceptable. And in that same issue, summer 1869, the compiler said, white men are being discharged from the police force of Washington and Negroes put in their places. Can white men look on and not condemn. And so it is a very racialized, racist moment and movement that Douglas is going to be arriving in Gettysburg during. Now, the other paper in town, the Star and Sentinel, is the Republican paper. It is the more progressive paper, politically, of its era. And on January 15th, 10 days out from his arrival, the editor of the Star and Sentinel uh, would say that we learn that arrangements are being made to secure Fred Douglas to lecture in Agricultural Hall on the evening of the 25th. Although Mr. D is a colored man, having been a slave in Maryland, he is regarded as one of the most eloquent speakers of the day. Now, when Douglas is invited to speak in Gettysburg, it's probably, we don't know this for certain, but it's probably by David Bueller. And David Bueller was an abolitionist. He was one of Gettysburg's former postmasters during the battle. He served that role. His wife was Fanny Bueller. Some of listeners might be familiar with her little memoir of being a nurse at the Adams County Courthouse uh, in the aftermath of the battle. And uh, it's probably Bueller, as best I can tell, who more than likely invited him. Hence, the fact that he was the editor of the Star and Sentinel, that would go a long way in explaining why the Star and Sentinel seems to be the first place where uh, where the announcement of Douglas seems to have been uh, printed, that he was going to be coming into Gettysburg. Now, the Agricultural Hall, we'll talk more about it in a moment, but that is where Douglas was scheduled to speak. That building no longer exists, but it would have been at that point in time a fairly new building on the southwest edge of Gettysburg at the intersection of High Street and Franklin Street. And for those familiar with Gettysburg, this would be the intersection where the uh, where High Street Brews, the beer distributor, is located. That sits on the northwest corner of the intersection. This would be catty corner to it. On the southeast corner of that same intersection is where this very large fairgrounds complex stood in the aftermath of the Civil War. And the major building at the centerpiece of that fairgrounds was Agricultural Hall. So right across from the uh, from the M&T Bank today. There is a small marker. There's like an apartment complex there. And there's a marker on a stone listing it as the former agricultural hall site. And it does mention Douglas having been uh, been there. The Star and Sentinel also said January 15th, we hope, uh, excuse me, um, Mr. Douglas has acquired a high reputation as a platform speaker. We hope the arrangements may be perfected. A week later, January 22nd, just three days before he was slated to arrive, the Star and Sentinel said, We are glad to announce that the lecture of this distinguished colored order is a fixed fact to come off in Agricultural Hall on Monday night next. That Fred Douglas has talent, few will deny. And they cite a recent 
New York Poll, which ranked Douglas as third among active American speakers. And today I think that we do lose sight of that. Douglas was one of the most famous people of his era. Uh, he was probably the most famous African American of the 19th century. He is perhaps more photographed than any American of the 19th century. That has been uh, some relatively recent research over the past few years, but uh, but reportedly there are more photographs taken of Douglas than any other person in the 19th century in the United States. The Star and Sentinel on January 22nd encouraged its readers to, quote, any who have the least desire to hear him, we say go, for this is probably the most convenient and perhaps the only opportunity that will soon again be given. Without doubt, next Monday evening, we'll see the largest audience in Agricultural Hall that has ever been gathered there. Report says that our Hanover neighbors, Hanover being about 15 miles east of Gettysburg, expect to charter a train car for the occasion. Let them come, says the paper, though perhaps they had better send word beforehand the admission fee had been placed at the nominal sum of 50 cents. That looks like it's about $9.80 today. So, you know, $10, think of uh, of a movie ticket. It's basically what people are paying to go see Douglas speak. Uh, on January 22nd, the Starn Sentinel concluded, those who would secure seats must do so early, for we are assured that tickets for no more that can be comfortably seated will be issued. And on the next page, they remind their readers again with a, a brief ad to make sure that they go hear Douglas speak if they are able to do so. Douglas will arrive on the evening of January 25th. He appears to have spent just one night in Gettysburg. Uh, the path we can generally trace, it's a pretty similar one to those who are familiar with uh, the likes of Lincoln or uh, uh, Andrew Curtin or Oliver Howard or any of these folks who who arrive in Gettysburg in, in the aftermath of the battle or the war, Ulysses Grant, they get to the train station. And when they get to the train station, they march south to the square. Now, unlike the likes of Howard, Lincoln, Grant, etc., Douglas is apparently not invited, at least the paper doesn't say he is, to the home of David Wills on the southeast corner of the square. And to me, that is quite intriguing, that he is a very important person, that he is one of the most famous figures of his era, and has not extended the invitation that... Uh, that other VIPs were. Instead, Douglas will stay across the street from the Wills house at the Franklin house. So the northeast corner of the square. This is also for a time called the McClellan Hotel and Tavern. Today, this is the site of the Gettysburg Hotel. So for those familiar with the town, you come into the train station along Carlisle Street, about a block north of the square. You would have walked down past what is today the uh, um, Majestic Theater. He is reportedly going to be joined by uh, by some students from the college. The compiler said that uh, Fred arrived by Monday evening's train, was conveyed in a hack, another word for a hired horse, under escort of a committee of the college societies to the Franklin House, a short square. Supper over, he took his meals in his room. The hack again appeared and was driven to the hall. And that's the intersection, as I mentioned, of High and Franklin Streets. So Douglas, to recap, gets into town on that evening via the train station, is accompanied by students. They go to uh, the Franklin house. He eats alone in his room. There's no grand reception given him. You know, there, I, I hate to insinuate, but you have to wonder whether race plays a role in that, where there are fears for his well-being. We'll get to more of that in, in just a moment. But this is an era where there are a lot of assassination threats. I don't know of any legitimate attempts made, but Douglas does appear to have been threatened of assassination a few times, and that insinuation has been made with regard to his trip at Gettysburg, so far as I can tell, without any real substantial evidence of, of that. And then I don't exactly know what route he'll take to get to Agricultural Hall, but that is generally southwest, so he could have gone west on Chambersburg Street and then gone down Washington Street. Um... Oh, I'm sorry, Franklin Street. Um, he could have uh, he could have gone south on Baltimore Street and then west on High Street. It, it's really tough to say, but um, in some fashion, he makes his way to Agricultural Hall. Now, at the time of his arrival in 1869, as I briefly alluded to a moment ago, this is a fairly new building. It had been established a couple of years earlier, in the spring of 1867. 
And what brought it about was the moving of the fairgrounds by the Adams County Agricultural and Horticultural Association. They had been at Benderville, a few miles north of Gettysburg, and then they moved it to Gettysburg. And as best I can tell, based on the press reports, a group of farmers literally disassembled the building from its former location, reassembled it, they moved it, and then reassembled it at its new location along High and Franklin Streets in Gettysburg. So they disassembled the building, packed it up onto carts, moved it to Gettysburg, and, and rebuilt it. And this was part of this kind of sprawling fairgrounds complex. It included a horse trotting course, and in some of those late 1860s, early 1870s photographs of Gettysburg, I can think of one that's in William Frazanito's Gettysburg, A Journey in Time. You can see a little bit of the uh, of that horse trotting course. If anybody has seen the panoramic images taken from uh, uh, from the seminary cupola by William Tipton in 1885, you can kind of see it on there. But there was this you know circular track for horses. There were show stands. There was an exhibition building, and then this main hall where Douglas spoke, measured 80 feet long by 40 feet wide by 16 feet tall, and it was eventually enlarged in 1868 and ran uh, ran along High Street east to west. The main event at this facility was the annual September Adams County Fair, but throughout the year they also hosted lectures, plays, recitals, dances, meetings, and that lasted from 1867 when it was built until 1886, so for about 19 years. And at that time, the McClellan Opera House, which is Again, now the site of, of Gettysburg Hotel, uh, that sort of overtook Agricultural Hall as the main arts facility in Gettysburg. But this would have been the main building when Douglas gets there in 1869. Now, when he's introduced to the crowd, the compiler said that, quote, Fred Douglas was given a full house on Monday evening at 50 cents a head. As I mentioned, it's David Bueller. The Adam, uh, sorry, the uh, Star and Sentinel editor, former postmaster. He introduces Douglas in terms, says Bueller, not of praise merely, but adulation. The audience embarked only a few, uh, embraced only a few Negroes, but they sat in the midst of the white folks. So it is interesting. There are members of both races sitting in the audience here. And Douglas will begin by introducing a topic that, uh, Basically, in so many words, what he would say, and I'll, I'll quote a, a portion of it, he says that uh, for tyranny to lead to liberty, this, this is my words interpreting what he says, for, for tyranny to lead to liberty, drastic measures had to be taken. And he says that such measures could involve bloodshed and that war, though it wasn't preferred, was not only acceptable, but sometimes it was a necessity to achieve full freedom. And this was a lesson that Douglas had learned through his own, own enslavement. He had recognized that, uh, that there were occasions that called for violence. And uh, there's this famous instance where he takes up, uh, not doesn't take up arms, but he does engage in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with his, uh, with one of his former masters. And so Douglas was, was prone to violence and prone to recognizing that violence was necessary to achieve means, especially when it was something as drastic as war to end slavery. And so this is what Douglas said at the beginning. I'll, I'll quote his first paragraph or excerpts from the first few paragraphs here. I am here to speak to you tonight, said Douglas, of a great historical character. And in order to make that character intelligible, I will speak to you of a great people and of a great war. Of a great people, because only a great people can produce and support great men. And of a great war, because war is a school and develops great characters, great deeds, great qualities. Deplore it as we must. War, stern and terrible war, seems to be the inexorable condition exacted for every considerable addition made to the liberties of mankind. The world moves, but it moves only by fighting every inch of its disputed way. Right and wrong seem alike endowed with fighting qualities. If one does not prevail, the other will and must. Liberty is valued not merely for what it is, but for what it costs. A nation that tamely submits to oppression and wrong will always find other nations sufficiently mean to inflict wrong. 
A nation that has obtained its liberties without any agency of its own can never wear that liberty as securely and grandly as that nation can which has snatched or wrenched it from the iron hand of a reluctant tyrant. For not only should men think of their liberty in order to properly prize it, but they should bear in mind the tremendous hardships by which it has been achieved. In so many words, what Douglas is saying here is if we want to truly appreciate liberty, sometimes people have to fight for that liberty, and to fight for that liberty, some people need to kill, some people need to die. It's grim, of course, but that is what Douglas feels standing on a battlefield like Gettysburg seems to be what he calls the inexorable condition for the advancement of liberties for all of mankind. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the time, we don't exactly know what text Douglas spoke at Gettysburg. So when I excerpt these, I'm pulling them largely from one copy of the speech, which appears in the public, uh, I'm sorry, the published Frederick Douglass Papers, and that's a, a copy of the speech delivered in 1868 in Cleveland, Ohio. And the other copy of the speech that I'm excerpting from um, doesn't have a date on it, but it's slightly longer uh, uh, typed form of this speech, and that is, that is from the Library of Congress. So you can access that pretty easily if you go to Library of Congress, search William the Silent. There are all these typewritten pages, I think it's 30-odd pages. And so I, I've kind of pulled excerpts from both of those. There might certainly be some deviation. He doesn't mention Gettysburg specifically in either one of them. I find it very hard to believe that he would have been at Gettysburg and not made some mention of, uh, of the town, of the battle, of Lincoln in, in whatever version of the speech that he actually delivered at Agricultural Hall. But Douglas's thesis, he then says right after what I just read, is this. The liberties of mankind may be written in ink, but will gain little respect until they are also written in blood. In another version of that same idea, he says the line over which oppression may not go may be marked with ink, but it must be marked with blood. And so thus far, he has made it seem as though he is solely discussing the American story. And certainly, that's an argument that the people of Gettysburg and his audience could relate to. They had experienced, you know, the, the Civil War six years earlier. And more than any other audience, Gettysburg provided more personal examples probably than just about anyone. The rest of the nation saw war from a distance, uh, may have had family members engaged. But Gettysburg literally saw and felt the worst of it firsthand. In addition to his talk of war, as well as its causes and consequences, Douglas did deviate momentarily to comment on his status as a black speaker in post-war America. And he said, in part, that I may announce what subject I please, but I've never been able to ascend an American platform and get off without bringing, he says the N-word here, with me in some shape or another. Essentially, he is saying, there are some people who would look at him, think that his speaking is a joke, that he is just another N word, that he's just another colored man, to put it another way. And what could he possibly say that would better all Americans? A lot of people took this as just him griping about his conditions as an African American, but of course, Douglas had so much more to say than that. He then moved on to discuss the 80 Years War as a precursor to American liberty, and he said this in part Among the great wars of nations and parts of nations, waged to obtain a larger measure of liberty, or to maintain or defend the liberties already acquired, there is perhaps no one in history more important, certainly not one more remarkable and thrilling in its details, than that of which the Netherlands were the dreary and dismal scene during the last half of the 16th century. And he would go on to say that the American people have special reasons for often recurring to this war, and contemplating it with peculiar interest. For we are in larger measure than any other nation on the globe, the fortune and heirs and possessors of its beneficent results. And so he says that the civil and religious liberty that was achieved by the Netherlands opened the door to the United States through a revolution of its own. He assumes his audience, it's pretty clear when you read this, has some advanced knowledge of the subject. And as we talked about earlier, it seems foreign now, but was typical of the time that people had read Motley's books on the rise of the Dutch Republic. They would have had some prerequisite knowledge. And he does say this on, on William to kind of introduce him 
as a character as well as his counterpart, King Philip. Douglas said, I can only give you a faint picture of this war and the scenes taken, uh, I'm sorry, and the parts taken by Philip and William and by their respective countries. The scene is too varied, the material too abundant, the events too numerous, the situations too changeful for complete presentation of anything more than this. I will give you a hint, he says, of the war, its character, its causes, its final outcome, with some notion of the great hero who stands for my subject and who was the life and soul of that side of it, which stood for freedom and po- progress. And he goes on for several pages talking about the history of the conflict and of William in particular. Some of the story that I, I mentioned earlier, Douglas puts into, into more words and more, more detail. He then moves his comparisons to the Civil War. He talks about how the Civil War in the United States government, the United States War Department, At the start of the conflict in 1861, there was sort of a lack of a specific policy. For the U.S., the emancipation of slavery eventually becomes that specific policy, but it's covered initially by this kind of abstract idea of the preservation of the Union. For the Dutch, it was very similar. Their initial purpose was national independence, but it becomes very clear that there is a more humanitarian goal at at play, religious freedom, but it takes a while to get there. And Douglas thinks that that is a problem. He says that at first, both wars were almost purely physical, devoid of any great principle or moral idea to loom visibly above the struggle or give it direction. Another issue that Douglas sees in both conflicts is a lack of unity within otherwise agreeing factions. The South and the United States couldn't all agree on the purpose of their Secession, the people who could not afford to own enslaved people uh, didn't quite have the same thing at stake as large planters and and property owners. Um, Although, of course, those poor plebeian farmers aspired to eventually be able, by and large, to, to own enslaved people. But there is this contentiousness in the American South. There's a divided North, as Douglas calls it as well. People who very much agreed that the United States should abolish slavery through this conflict. Others entirely disagreed with that matter. And as Douglas would say, as there were Tories during the American Revolution and Copperheads during our late Civil War, so there were persons answering this description at this time in the Netherlands. There, too, was a united South against a divided North, a North weak and divided at the very point where it should have been united and strong, and which was, to all appearances, an easy prey. He talked about another issue being the lack of early success for both the Dutch and for the United States Army. The earlier years of the war, says Douglas, resembled our experiences during the earlier period of our war against slavery. The advantage in both cases was decidedly with the enemies of liberty, with the Spanish and with the Confederacy, respectively. He says it was the misfortune of the reformers, as it was ours, to be embarrassed with raw recruits, incompetent generals, inferior arms, and an empty treasury. They had their bull runs, their balls bluffs, and their Fredericksburgs. Like ourselves, they were educated for war by war. But alas, how slow and painful was the process. By what startling and terrible reverses, by what dreadful disasters on flood and field, by what horrors of sack and pillage, of sword and fire, this wisdom came. And this goes back to that idea of Douglas's main thesis, the line over which oppression may not go, may be marked with ink, but it must be marked with blood. He's saying that you can have proclamations and declarations and amendments, but they don't mean much until people have sacrificed themselves on a battlefield, and that liberty can be bought with blood. And as he says here, this is a great lesson. It's an unfortunate one. It's a bloody one. It's a costly one, but it is one that needed to be learned and ultimately was. And the last thing that he says to compare these two conflicts is the extremism of the enemies of the Dutch and of the United States. What makes this struggle between the Dutch and the Spanish interesting and attractive is the disparity that existed between the parties, said Douglas. In our country, too, we have to thank the extravagance of the slaveholders for the abolition of slavery, as we have to thank the violence of the Spanish persecution for the establishment of religious liberty in the Netherlands. Essentially, what he is saying here, were slavery not as bad as it was, 
it might have taken longer to end because people couldn't have hated it as much and hated the people who propagated it. And he says the enemies of the United States were the Confederacy and it, it took the barbarity of slavery for us to have a reason to, uh, to compel them to surrender ultimately after four years of war. Douglas then moved to the strength of the leaders, William the Silent and Abraham Lincoln. The experience of this great people in the early years of their war was strikingly like our own in the earlier years of our struggle in the late rebellion, Douglas said. Like them, we suffered disaster until we learned to choose the true man, the silent man of the American people. Theirs was William, ours was Lincoln. What Abraham Lincoln was to us when a treacherous chief magistrate surrendered the integrity to the menacing armies of the slaveholding rebellion, William the Silent was to the struggling cause of religious liberty in the Netherlands against Spain. Both men were loved by their people. The countrymen of William soon learned to call him Father William, as we learned to call Abraham Lincoln Father Abraham. For the same reason we loved and trusted him. There was no trust, no end to the trust and confidence we placed in Lincoln. No matter what mistake happened, no matter what disaster followed, a hundred battles might be lost, the nation could never lose confidence in Lincoln. Of course, a little bit of rewriting of history by Douglas there. Lincoln wasn't even sure he would achieve a second term because of the disparity toward him. But in hindsight, of course, Lincoln looms largest as great American leader, and Douglas saw it in, in that fashion as well. Happily, says Douglas, the character required by the crisis was readily supplied by the country in both cases. The hour and the man were well met. There was no attribute of social, moral, intellectual, intellectual, or physical perfection demanded which these men did not possess. Both William and Lincoln exhibited the grandest qualities of a great leader, he said, in that he could convert the most appalling disasters and crushing defeats into higher and stronger motives for increased exertion. Both never gave up on the cause to which he had dedicated all his powers, and upon the success of which he had nobly staked his honor, his fortune, and his life. And then Douglas would say that both men were, as we have seen, at the head of fearfully divided peoples, and both possessed in large measure the high qualities needed to soften asperities and heal divisions among them. Both were devoting themselves, heart and brain, to their country's services, while they were yet in the midst of their years, when the body and the mind were both at their best. Yet before age had plucked the fire from their hearts or dimmed the light in their eyes, the heavy cares of states had plowed deep furrows in their brows. And finally, he says that both expressed humor, but knew when seriousness was required. Great loving hearts, said Douglas, were in the breasts of both men. But there were some differences that Douglas noted. He called William a reformer, a thorough go going reformer, a leader of the people who did not hesitate. With Mr. Lincoln, the case was different. He waited for the people, and he desired to know to know not only what could be done, but what people, but what the people required to be done. So in that case, we could look at Douglas being frustrated earlier in the Civil War with Lincoln vacillating in the term that he used on slavery and its end and emancipation. William, he said, would, uh, would do anything without considering the political consequences of it. He also talked about their, their social standing and their backgrounds biographically. William was highborn, a prince of the blood, surrounded from the cradle with the best conditions that great wealth and high position could purchase, said Douglas. Lincoln, on the contrary, sprang from the lowest round of the social ladder with nothing but his simple manhood to support him. Now, a fascinating piece of what Douglas does rhetorically with this speech is he compares what he calls the great men of each war. He names some influences um, to, to, to William and Lincoln. And Douglas said that in part, only a great people can produce and support great men. And war is a school and develops great characters, great deeds, great qualities. That was an excerpt that I shared at the beginning of the speech. And here are some of those great men who he directly quotes from in the course of his speech. One is William Seward, former governor of New York, United States Senator from New York, and famously Lincoln and Andrew Johnson's uh, Secretary of State. Douglas said in his Gettysburg Address, such a conflict was unequal, but it was unavoidable. 
As ours was the irrepressible conflict of the 19th century, so was theirs, the, the Dutch that is, the irrepressible conflict of the 16th century. And that is a direct quote from Seward in 1858 calling the two systems of free labor and slave labor continually coming into closer contact and collision results an irrepressible conflict between opposing and enduring forces. Another main figure, great man of history, as Douglas called them, was Ulysses S. Grant, of course, general in chief of all United States armies by the end of the Civil War and ultimately president of the United States. Douglas said in his Gettysburg Address, in our days, he is a true statesman that takes the law from the lips of the people. And I think General Grant has taken no wiser ground or said no better word than that he will administer this government in accordance with the wishes of the American people. And Grant, by 1869, is the first year of his presidency. A year earlier, what Douglas is adopting from here is a quotation from Grant, who wrote on May 29, 1868, new political issues not foreseen are constantly arising. The views of the public on old ones are constantly changing, and a purely administrative officer should always be left free to execute the will of the people. So this idea of the wishes and the, and the will of the American people is at play. Another general turned president, George Washington. Douglas said that William the Silent on the one hand and George Washington on the other belonged to the same great chain of causes by which liberty has gained its present power. Washington, back in 1783, had written, if the example of the Americans successfully extending, uh, contending in the cause of freedom can be of any other use to other nations, we shall have an additional motive for rejoicing at so prosperous an event. So the same language, the cause of freedom, the chain of the causes of liberty, as Douglas says. Douglas even pulls from figures in the Bible. Luke the Evangelist, the author of the, the book of Luke in the Bible. Douglas talked about Lincoln and uh, being assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. And this is where he connects Luke quoting Jesus Christ on the cross. Douglas says that if Lincoln could have uttered a word after the cruel bullet of Booth went crashing through his brain, those who knew him best will not hesitate to believe that his last words would have been in keeping with that which came down from the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And this comes from Luke writing, When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Douglas would quote Frederick Harrison, who was a uh, historian, a jurist, a politician, social reformer, influential in swaying U.S. Uh, 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 English support of the U.S. during the Civil War, so similar to Motley drawing the Confederacy away from the Civil War. Uh, I'm sorry, the... Uh, drawing Europe away from the Confederacy. But Frederick Harrison in 1897 would eventually write a biography of William the Silent. And um, and Douglas says something very similar to, uh, to what Harrison says. Douglas said in his speech, William the Silent on the one hand and Washington on the other belonged to the same great chain of causes by which liberty has gained its present power. That idea was shared a moment ago. And Harrison, much the same way, talked about the quote-unquote parallel between William the Silent and George Washington being peculiarly close. Two more major figures would be the figures about whom Douglas spoke in his address. He directly quoted Lincoln and directly quoted William of Orange as being these great men of history. Douglas quoted Lincoln as saying, malice toward none, charity for all. Of course, Lincoln's famous words in the second inaugural address and in terms of William, Douglas would say, like our lamented president, William died by the hand of an assassin. He died uttering a prayer in mitigation of the punishment of the murderer, just as William had, apparently as he was dying, said aloud, oh my God, have mercy upon my soul. Oh my God, have mercy upon this poor people. Died while giving a prayer. He says that both, Douglas, uh, both Lincoln and William do just that. As the speech came to a close, and as I begin to wrap up here, the central message of freedom through sacrifice extended most obviously, in the case of Douglas's speech, to the, the fates of the men who served as the central metaphor, William and Lincoln. 
And whereas he started, Douglas, by discussing the blood that was shed by everyday warriors, he ended by highlighting the loss of these leaders and their influence and the comparisons and the ways that they died. And he says this, Resembling each other so closely in their temper, character, and relation to their times, it is remarkable that these two men should have resembled each other also in the manner of their deaths. Both were assassinated, and both manifested the same spirit of charity. It is worthy of remark, too, that William the Silent and Abraham Lincoln were alike fortunate as to the time at which they were called away from the stormy scenes of life. Both saw the mighty works of their great lives nearly completed and died amid the glorious triumphs of their respective causes. So William dies right as he is about to lead the Dutch people to liberty. Lincoln, of course, dies as he is leading the American Republic to victory in its civil war. And Douglas would partly close by saying, The secret power of both men can be found in their charity and their love for their fellow men. Pilgrims pay their vows at the tomb of William the Silent, and while liberty has a home in our land, dusky pilgrims will pay their way to the place where reposes the body of Abraham Lincoln. Though three centuries stretch away like an ocean, between your space and life and work, ye were cast in the same generous mold, ye were co-workers in the same great cause, and paid the same extreme penalty for your devotion, and together shall have your memories be cherished forever." And so that is going to be how Douglas brings an effective culmination to this comparison of Lincoln and William the Silent, to the speech that he delivered, at least in part. As I mentioned, we don't know exactly what words, but that's basically what he said at Gettysburg, at Agricultural Hall, bringing the meaning of Gettysburg, the meaning of the Civil War, the meaning of its causes and consequences onto the world stage. Now, there are some conflicting reports when Douglas finishes speaking as to whether he is followed by quote-unquote ardent admirers who complimented him with a serenade at the hotel. That's what one press report says. But the compiler says that this quote juvenile disgusting show did not come off, whether by reason of disappointment with Fred at the lecture or of the cooler councils of older stagers on the political boards. So on one hand, people said that a group of people followed Douglas back to the Franklin house where he had dined earlier, where he would lodge, it seems, that evening. Others said that is not what happened. Now, if you want to see an exercise, or in this case here, an exercise in reconstruction at a local level, in racism and civil rights language at a local level, look no further than the Star and Sentinel and the compiler and their reactions to Douglas's speech. The Starn Sentinel, the Republican paper, the progressive paper, located on the square, right next to the Wills House. The compiler located just a few blocks down Baltimore Street, edited by Henry Stahl, uh, by any terms, both then or, or now, an ardent white supremacist. Look no further than almost any edition of the compiler from this era, and uh, using brutally blatant racist language, using the N-word speaking disparagingly of even African-American children in many instances. This is how each of these papers saw Douglas's speech at Gettysburg. The Star and Sentinel said, We think we do no injustice to the distinguished speakers who preceded him when we say that Mr. Douglas's effort was the lecture of the season. That he is a man of brains and force of character cannot be questioned. No man without brains, white or black, could maintain the position held by Mr. Douglas among the distinguished platform talkers of the day. No name in England or America can attract larger audiences in the great centers of intellect. Douglas shrewdly availed himself to introduce occasional sharp and telling thrusts, and men in parties which brought down the house. For an hour and three quarters, the lecturer held the unbroken attention of his audience. Occasionally, as he left his manuscript, rising into impassioned eloquence and again evoking applause by some sharp pleasantry. So January 29th, four days after Douglas spoke, that week's edition of the Star and Sentinel, it seems could not have been more laudatory, more celebratory of Douglas's efforts. The compiler on the flip side feels the exact opposite. Here's what it wrote, January 29th. 
the radical politicians true to party exerted themselves for their pet, the Negro. The advantage possessed by the African in these Negro worshipping days is frequently made apparent. But nowhere has it been more strikingly done in this town during the last 10 days, as men were forced to listen to the ebony idol. In Douglas's remarks, the Negro was of course painted in the most flattering colors. And so on to the end of the impertinent and rancorous tirade of an hour and a half. In a literary point of view, the lecture fell far short of general expectation. It is safe to assert that there are in this very town a dozen men who, by reason of superior brain and culture, will beat Fred Douglas at the lecture desk any and every day simply because they are white. Clearly, the distinction enjoyed by Fred Douglas is due to two facts. That he is a Negro, and that a party in this country has made the Negro its platform. Any way you slice that up, there's a, a, a severe racist overtone to it by Henry Stahl and the Gettysburg Compiler. Now, Douglas, as I mentioned, would deliver this speech elsewhere over the course of a, about three years' time. And in hindsight, the eventual reactions from scholars at the time, social reformers, journalists, historians, almost unanimously positive, despite the fact that this speech is now relatively forgotten. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, famous women's rights advocate, she had written in 1869, the same year Douglas spoke at Gettysburg, that Douglas's hair is fast becoming white as snow, which adds greatly to the dignity of his countenance. We hear his lecture on William the Silent much praised. Howard M. Jenkins, who was the editor of the Philadelphia newspaper called the Friends Intelligencer. And uh, Howard Jenkins, if you find a picture of him, has a striking resemblance to the actor Nick Offerman. I, I, see, uh, I see Ron Swanson when I see Howard Jenkins. Nevertheless, he says, William the Silent was adorned with exquisite wit and pathos and given forth in that wonderful voice which, once heard, will not be forgotten. James M. Gregory who was an African-American and author of a book called Frederick Douglass, The Orator, which was the first biography of Douglass, published in 1893. Douglass was still alive when it was published. Gregory said that William the Silent, in the judgment of many, will take first rank among the writings of Mr. Douglass. Sorry if you can hear my dog barking in the background. Charles B. Purvis, who was a physician and a eulogist of Douglass in 1895, said that his lecture on William the Silent will take rank as a literary effort. John W. Thompson, another African-American orator and historian, he said that while there were many others that brilliantly proved their right to the freedom they plead for, there was perhaps no one of them that stood upon so high a pedestal as Douglas. His lecture on William the Silent settled that point. And finally, maybe the most famous of these individuals who reflected on it, Booker T. Washington order, historian, presidential advisor, eventually as well a Douglas biographer. And he said that William the Silent showed a wide reading and a mastery of the art of eloquence. Douglas had mixed feelings on his own impact of his address. He initially defended himself against naysayers. Um, he said that time and the onward march of liberal ideas have wrought wonders and the end is not yet. He wished to encourage listeners to be encouraged in knowing that the growing enlightenment of mankind, as he called it, would inspire others to overcome unre unresolved obstacles. He says that was the point of the speech, is that these stories play out, these, these themes seem to mirror one another of these conflicts, and my only point is to say that maybe we could learn from historical examples of how we should remember this war. But he later exhibits this feeling of, Remembering that he felt he had low energy when he delivered William the Silent, he thought he had a lack of passion. He said he was only giving speeches because people had come to expect that he would. He felt it was the only thing he was good at. He would write in his last memoir that this was a period when he, he felt that uh, his occupation was gone, that it was as if he was a, a minister at a church, that uh, his congregation had left, that by slavery being over, of course, he had achieved his life's work, but that delivering speeches like this was a, a negative side effect, that he felt he wasn't talking about things that matter to him quite as much as, as ongoing civil rights matters. And he says that he could never get, quote, beyond Frederick Douglass, the self-educated fugitive slave. That was constantly what people expected 
from him was these stories of him being a slave, but he wanted to talk about something so much more. In 1877, in Boston, he described William the Silent as having gone, quote, somewhat disastrously. He wished it to be something grand, high, and surprising by introducing a great historical character, a man who lived and wrought in a remote age and country, a real hero in his day and generation. But Douglas felt that though the theme was sublime and glorious, it was impossible for him to overcome the barriers of time and space. And in his mind, he could not bring the subject home to his audience. Despite having labored hard and attempting his best effort at being historical, philosophical, reformatory, and aesthetically pleasing, but all to no purpose, he said, as the audience escaped entirely. He would end by saying, despite the highest flights of oratory, the lights would burn dimly, the air would grow heavy, and sleepiness would creep over the weary crowd. Almost the most lively and most cheerful moment of the whole of this intellectual entertainment, Douglas concluded, was when he meekly bowed and retired from the platform. But he would build upon the content, the style, and the arguments of this speech. In many ways, the themes of this speech would influence more famous subsequent addresses. He delivers a speech at Madison Square in New York in 1878 for Decoration Day. Uh, delivers a speech at the Freedmen's Memorial that I mentioned earlier on the anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. And in so many ways, the themes of this Gettysburg Address really kind of match up with, with those subjects as well. Now, there is one occasion on which Douglas reused the William the Silent Lincoln analogy, and that is in 1883. So this is more than a decade since the time he was at Gettysburg, and we're about a decade out from, from his own death in 1895, 12 years after he, he spoke these words. But this was uh, a speech honoring the 21st anniversary of the end of slavery in Washington, D.C. And Douglas returns to this William the Silent idea, and he says, Could William the Silent have foreseen the misery and ruin he would bring upon his country by taking up the sword against the Spanish Inquisition? He might have thought the sacrifice too hard. Could Abraham Lincoln have foreseen the immense cost, the terrible hardship, the awful waste of blood and treasure? Could he have foreseen the tears of the widows and orphans, and his own warm blood trickling at the bidding of an assassin's bullet, he might have thought the sacrifice too great. In every great moment, men are prepared by preceding events for those which are to come. He ne we neither know the evil nor the good which may be in store for us. And here we have Douglas essentially saying, we can use these historical examples to learn from. He's returning to that idea and these men lived, William and Lincoln, during awful times and were forced to lead peoples during uh, really trying hours. And they easily could have said, this is too hard, the cost is too bloody, this is too much for me or for any man, and, and given up. But ultimately, they provide us with great historical examples, is essentially what Douglas is saying. And so it is a worthwhile endeavor. After all, he says, to uh, to compare these two men, even though he had been among the chorus of individuals saying that perhaps the William the Silent oration was not quite as effective as, as perhaps he had hoped it might be. It is also worth noting that around this same time, that was 1883, in 1881, Douglas published The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, his final autobiography. And in the section where he's talking about Lincoln's re-election and the second inaugural, he also uses the William the Silent example there. He's talking about the end of the war, how Grant and Sherman are uh, starting to you know, quell the rebellion at, at the locations that they are, Grant in the East, Sherman in the West, uh, as he says, dealing staggering blows dealt upon the rebellion that year by their armies. And he says in part this, since William the Silent, who was the soul of the mighty war for religious liberty against Spain and the Spanish Inquisition, no leader of men has been loved and trusted in such generous measures as was Abraham Lincoln. So there as well, another connection, realizing that maybe the historical allusion to William and connecting him to Lincoln was worthwhile after all. Douglas would ultimately die on February 20th, 1895. And in Gettysburg, he was remembered by both the compiler and the Star and Sentinel, those two partisan papers that 
in their editorializing had reflected upon Douglas's Gettysburg speech in quite different ways. The Sentinel, after Douglas died, looked upon him uh, in the next week's paper as a, quote, man of eloquence and great ability. He will be well remembered in Gettysburg. And the compiler wrote an even lengthier reflection and a little kind of biographical obituary, despite its, uh, you know, racism against Douglas for saying, you know, almost any white person in this town could give a better speech because they are white. Uh, despite that, now that we approach the 20th century, the, the feeling on Douglas has changed quite a bit. And the compiler will say of Douglas that he was a man of perseverance, a man who beheld a subsequently won reputation and one of American politics most picturesque figures. The paper even lifted him to the rank of, quote, probably the best known Negro who has ever been before the people of the United States. Now, this speech by Frederick Douglass is largely forgotten in Gettysburg history, and I believe that until this time, I don't know that anybody has done as much in depth on it as I have had the pleasure of, of looking into it over the course of time, and hopefully I'll write something more lengthy about it at some point. But it is overshadowed by not only Lincoln's address, but other dedicatory speeches, and that's mostly when we think of Gettysburg speeches, things like monument dedication addresses which while they oftentimes do lead toward focuses upon slavery and emancipation, the most famous speeches in Gettysburg history after Lincoln's have a re really kind of reconciliationist rhetoric to them. Think of the 50th anniversary or 75th anniversary as being the prime examples of that. Douglas is, his address is by no means this reconciliationist sort of reunion um, feel good address. It is more uh, of an effort to contextualize the Civil War as a striking battle of, of good and evil, essentially, between the slaveholding South and the United States and its uh, capabilities of, of conquering the South and, and promoting emancipation. And he looks at Lincoln as that good figure, as the, the white knight, if you will, against the, the darkness that the Confederacy represented. So that speech and that feel and that tone does differ quite a bit from what would eventually become much more famous sorts of topics in Gettysburg. Agricultural Hall no longer stands, as I mentioned, but there is a, a little monument, a marker. Uh, Agricultural Hall had been in existence really until 1886 as a formidable location of, uh, of community and of entertainment in Gettysburg. And it was auctioned at a sheriff's sale that year, 1886, to make way for community housing. It never quite became that, but it was the site of the eventual Gettysburg Hosiery and Knitting Company. There was also a paper box factory there. In the 20th century, it became apartments, and then it did become a low-income housing complex, which was taken down in December 1991 by the Adams County Housing Authority. For a time, it was uh, thought th that it, it should be named in honor of Douglas, and I, I think for a time it, it was briefly uh, I don't know what capacity that took on, but the idea was that it, it would be named for Douglas, this housing development community. And if you go there today, along, uh, along High Street, there is a small, what looks like a street sign, essentially. And I think it says Frederick Douglas Way. And it is just a, a sidewalk, basically, that goes behind these, these apartments or condos. But a, a little, uh, you know, between the marker and, and the Frederick Douglas Way, uh, mention, you know, Douglas, it, it does get a little bit of his due credit at, at that location. This is not a speech that is typically mentioned, William the Silent, among the litany of great Douglas speeches today. As we saw, you know, a moment ago, there were a lot of people in that time that, that held it up pretty high, but it has sort of become largely forgotten. David Blight, Frederick Douglass biographer, he has called this an odd address and one that in time Douglas was not very proud of. He also called it, Blight did, a, a bit of a dud. But as we said, it is remembered by many of Douglas's earliest admirers as a, a worthy and worthwhile effort. And despite its shortfalls, it did give Gettysburg a prominent black voice in an era of predominantly white ones, including, as we've seen, many prejudicial ones. And, you know, really in a great twist of fate, it's Douglas's old axiom to use newspapers and the, the four that he owned to agitate the status quo. Uh, 
And in turn, newspapers actually ended up agitating the racist elements of the Gettysburg press, as we've seen in the form of the compiler. So there is just as much as a Frederick Douglass history and a Civil War memory history, we have kind of an exercise in Reconstruction era newspapers that we can look at as a, a veritable lens through which to understand the past and understand this moment and its ramifications. But the speech as well did carry on Lincoln's legacy at Gettysburg and the legacy of the battle itself, of, of kind of naming Gettysburg as a place of great sacrifice. But there was progress. There was great bloodshed, but there was growth as Douglas sees things. And it brought further meaning to as we've said, proclamations, amendments, and declarations, which are those items written in ink. And Douglas did this by paying homage to United States soldiers who died upon the Gettysburg battlefield to make that ink permanent, as he called it, the actions that are also marked with blood. And where I will end is with this. After Douglas's death, his widow, his second wife, Helen Pitts, a white woman who he married after the death of Anna Murray, his first wife, in 1882. Helen Pitts eulogized Douglas by summing up his life in kind of a richly eloquent fashion. She said, The world does not need to be told who Frederick Douglass was or why he lived. So long had he stood as a synonym for human fran enfranchisement, so thoroughly he had identified with the effort for its achievement, that to speak his name was to give an epitome of the anti-slavery struggle in the United States. He was a tower of strength to those whose cause he espoused. He was honored by the virtuous and feared by the mean and wicked. He was without fear and without reproach. His was a living consecration, and he endured unto the end. And with that, we can circle back to the final argument on behalf of William and Lincoln that Douglas made in his Gettysburg Address. I have not excerpted this, but he basically concluded a major piece of that address by saying of Douglas and of Lincoln that, quote, he loved his fellow men. He had compassion even for the guilty wretch. He should ever think of him. Uh, we should ever think of him without remembering how vastly we are now indebted to him for the liberty of thought and speech we now enjoy. It is impossible to take the measure of that debt or the measure of the man to whom it was due. We have no scales to weigh his worth no standard by which to determine the value of his sacrifices. He toiled, sacrificed, and died. We live, and life has been made easier and happier by his life and works. And I think that you know we could easily see there that people would say the same about Douglas in the aftermath of, of his life. Douglas also said this in his Gettysburg Address. To say the world moves is easy since Galileo. To cross the ocean is easy since Columbus. It is easy to walk in the night when the moon and stars are bright in the sky. It is easy to dwell amid fruitful fields when the pioneer has removed the noxious weeds and poisonous vapors. It is easy to speak of British liberty since Magna Carta. It is easy to be a Catholic in Rome and an abolitionist in a land where slavery lies dead. And so it is easy to preach freedom of thought and speech since William the Silent and Abraham Lincoln. And that's how Douglas ended his Gettysburg Address. I'll end our time here by simply adding that it is easy to fondly explore the power of memory and to really believe in the language of liberty, if you will, since Frederick Douglass. And so I thank you for listening along to this story of Douglass and, and his time at Gettysburg, largely forgotten, though it is. Hopefully we can bring light and, and memory to it. If you are interested in reading more on Douglass and, and Lincoln and the facets that went into this address, uh, the first place I would recommend starting is with a book I've mentioned a couple of times, David W. White, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, published in 2018. Um, a little self-aggrandizement. Uh, if you look in the footnotes, you'll notice that uh, when he talks about Gettysburg and, and Douglass's presence there, uh, Dr. Blight was kind enough to cite me with a, a citation there after a, a conversation he and I had about Douglas's presence in Gettysburg, and I offered some of the press accounts that I had to come across, and, and he ends up quoting a couple of them in the book. William McFeely wrote a little bit of an older biography, just called Frederick Douglass. I think that was published in 1991. Dr. Blight also wrote a book, a smaller book called Frederick Douglass's Civil War, Keeping Faith in Jubilee, and that is kind of a series of essays. So those are the three main places I would go for Douglas material just in general. There are also some great studies, kind of dual biographies of Douglas and Lincoln. James Oakes wrote a book called The Radical and the Republican, 
and that is a wonderful place to start. John Stauffer wrote a book called Giants, The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. And then there is also a book uh, simply called Douglass and Lincoln. That's by Paul Kendrick and Stephen Kendrick. I think that those are the kind of best places to go. If you're interested in continuing to follow along with my work, uh, feel free to check out Cody Aish, writer and historian on Facebook. That's C-O-D-I-E-E-A-S-H, writer and historian. I like to po- post a lot about Douglas and, and these sorts of topics that we have discussed here. You can also follow along with me through Pennsylvania and the Civil War at pencivilwar.com. Also find us on major social media platforms and the Battles and Banter podcast, a military history podcast uh, covering all facets really of international military history, mostly American, but uh, with my pals Avery and, and Tony there uh, discussing those matters. So I thank you again for listening. I thank you to Matt for the opportunity to, again, be part of Addressing Gettysburg. Hope everybody enjoyed this subject. Hope everybody learned a little bit of something, and hopefully you'll go out to that site. Again, if you go to the intersection of uh, High Street and Franklin Street, southeast corner, that's where Douglas spoke. Uh, look up maybe the Library of Congress copy of the speech if you're so inclined. Read it and uh, get a little bit better understanding of the historical connections that Mr. Douglas tried to make upon a site that means so much to all of us, the Gettysburg battlefield and the town of Gettysburg itself. But I thank you all very much for listening. Take care, stay safe, and uh, I'll catch up with you next time.